Hi everyone, my name is Oliver Chin and I'm an ENT practicing in Sugarland, Texas. One of the more common things that patients come in to see me for is ear fullness. And ear fullness can range anywhere from disease of the outer ear to the eardrum to the middle ear and all the way up towards the brain. And sometimes it's hard to differentiate without having a comprehensive history and physical exam. In my repertoire, I typically like to ask patients the duration of their symptoms, if there's any aggravating or alleviating factors. Some more targeted questions include barrow challenges, such as if you're having difficulty or worsening symptoms flying, or barometric pressure changes when the weather changes, or when allergy seasons flare up, when you scuba or you're diving into the water and there's been any prior trial of treatment for any kind of nasal medicines or any type of ear medicines. When I make sure I take a look, I try to use otomicroscopy, which is a high-powered microscope to look at the ear canal, the eardrum, and try to attempt to make view of the middle ear structures. And depending on what we see, it could explain why you're feeling the way you're feeling. Other additional tests that we incorporate into trying to figure out what ear fullness is due to includes audiogram with tympanometry, which is a test of the hearing and the function of the middle ear space, and also just to see how the eardrum is vibrating. I'll oftentimes try to ask if you're able to, on command, pop your ears, and if I can physically see you do it, then maybe we can rule out or rule in a issue with your eustachian tube. The other tests that we order sometimes include CT scans and MRIs. For those patients that we come to the conclusion of maybe it's a eustachian tube issue, we try to see if there's any reversible causes of eustachian tube dysfunction, and that can come all the way from allergies or if there's any physical blockages of the eustachian tube opening, which can range anywhere from adenoids that are still large or have regrown, or if there's actually masses that can occur in the back of the nose. Nasal pharyngoscopy, which is passing a camera in through the nostril to take a look at the back of the nose, can provide a wealth of information and help us make a decision about how we can further treat ear clogging. For those patients who develop fluid behind their eardrums frequently or easily or have a hard time with clearing their ears, we oftentimes talk about treatment options with intervention, and that could include putting a hole in the eardrum with or without putting an ear tube in. And this could help with draining fluid out, equalize the pressure, and either give the ear a chance to recover, or if there truly is still an issue with the plumbing, we can talk about a procedure that can be done in the clinic in a minimally invasive fashion to stretch open the opening of that eustachian tube. And this has a chance of improving the ability for some patients to equalize the pressure and to help alleviate that ear clocking sensation. Eustachian tube dysfunction has a variety of severity and depends on how we're able to get you to be able to manage the symptoms. I have some patients who are able to automatically reverse the symptoms on their own. Sometimes we need to help and assist these patients, uh, especially if there is a specific scenario where their eustachian tube dysfunction is worse. And there are certain patients that just have a very hard time with being able to get their eustachian tubes to work. And those are the patients that we try our best to make a determination of how aggressive we need to be in treating them. Ear tubes and the eustachian tube balloon dilation are strategies that we can incorporate into the the overall approach for the dysfunction, try to make the eustachian tube work better. Eustachian tube balloon dilation, in my opinion, is a procedure that we can aim to address the underlying reason why we might be having a hard time with popping our ears. The balloon dilation can be done in the clinic in an outpatient fashion where you come into the clinic and we topicalize and anesthetize the nose and then place a catheter that has actually been used in other parts of the body such as the heart blood vessels, the throat and the airway to stretch that tube open to make it easier for us to pop our ears to try to attempt to reverse any process that is causing fluid to build up or the pressure to mount. The procedure lasts anywhere from 10 minutes to 45 minutes, and most people tolerate this and can drive on their own back home. The recovery process is fairly easy, and most patients get back to work that day. The general risk of the surgery is less than 1% 
And this is something that can be easily tolerated in the clinic. Results from the procedure are sometimes immediate and sometimes can take several months to develop. However, there are some patients who have very successful outcomes from the balloon dilation and are able to get back to popping their ears and equalizing pressure easily. And there are certain patients that we still struggle with. Eustachian two balloon dilation should be carefully thought and patient selection is very, very important. Eustachian two balloon dilation can also be used as an adjuvant procedure in patients who have perforations of their eardrums and also chronic drainage of the ears or who have also developed cholesteatomas, which is an aggressive middle ear disease that can destroy hearing structures and cause complications related to the facial nerve, to the hearing, to the balance, and to the skull base. The balloon dilation can sometimes address the potentially underlying cause for why we have developed the hole or why the hole hasn't healed up and to try to address the root cause so that if we do a reconstructive surgery or we do a surgery to remove this cholesteatoma, that it has a less likely chance of coming back. To determine if you are a candidate or if you need any of these interventions requires detailed clinical history taking and physical examination. If you feel like you have any of these symptoms, the most important first step is to make an appointment and come in and have your ears taken a look at and tell me what you're feeling and what you're experiencing and we go from there. And if we need to do any of these, then we talk things through and we figure out a treatment plan together.